Thank you so much. And I just love this village. You know, I've been coming to this village. I think it is three uh, years in a row. Uh, and I do miss DEF CON a lot. And some of you know my sister, Karen Elzari. I often go to DEF CON with her and we definitely uh, miss that experience. But I am very excited to be here with you today. And today I'm also joined with a really good colleague of mine, Anna E. She's a spectacular engineer. Uh, from the IOTG, the IOTG business unit with us. And we're going to be talking with you today on this evolving landscape of baseline standards and regulation. So first of all, let me check again. Can you all hear us great, Sam, team? Yep, we can. Wonderful. Uh, well, as Sam shared, uh, we are both from Intel. Uh, I work in the government uh, relation team at Intel uh, within the legal department. I work with governments around the world and policymakers on issues of security policy. And I also lecture at the UC Berkeley School of Information, where I teach in the Master in Cybersecurity program. Uh, and as many, of you, as many of you know, I'm also Israeli. And usually when I come to this village, I start with a direct question. Uh, so let me do it again. Uh, by now, most of you should be familiar with this face, uh, and I hope you know him. This is Kevin Finster. He is a researcher, and like many of you in the audience, he is also focused on embedded systems. And specifically, he has uh, a love and passion towards drones, uh, and he has conducted research on DJI, uh, one of their drone systems, and he found a vulnerability that, according to him, uh, leaked personal information, and he wanted to report that vulnerability to DJI and, you know, do the right thing uh, and engage in, in, in disclosure. And at the time, uh, DJI just launched their bug bounty program with this media announcement, inviting the community, inviting the ecosystem to report vulnerabilities to them. Um, and, you know, it was not really clear what was the scope, according to the reports. Uh, there wasn't really a bug bounty policy or contract, and there was some confusion between the parties on this issue of the scope, according to the reports. So Kevin contacted DJI and asked them, is this vulnerability that I found uh, is in scope? And they, in fact, um, according to the reports, suggested it is in scope. Not only that, they said that uh, they would like to pay him $30,000 for that vulnerability. So for those of you engaged in bug hunting, uh, just empirically speaking, academically, that's a pretty high bounty. Uh, and then the plot thickened. So there are two styles to the story, and I encourage you to check out the links in the bottom. Uh, but Kevin felt that during the negotiation uh, on issues of disclosure, there were some issues that were unclear, again, because we didn't have that scope and website. And then the plot thickened, and then a, and a draft letter mentioning the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the main anti-hacking law here in the United States, together with the DMCA, was mentioned, according to the reports in that letter. And Kevin ended up walking away from this approved bug bounty of $30,000 and sharing on Twitter uh, his version of the story. Um, and, you know, he did order a Tesla. He ended up canceling that order of a Tesla. And it's just a story highlighting some of the nuance between laws and bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure uh, programs in this evolving landscape of anti-hacking laws. Uh, and it's a story that uh, I shared a lot during the last few years. And I'm, I'm actually happy to report that we have seen um, Maybe also because Kevin uh, went and shared this story, a lot of progress in this area. We have seen a lot of safe harbor adoptions and a lot of uh, collaborations between companies and researchers. And even recently, uh, it was announced this week, and maybe you have seen the draft uh, CISA binding operative directive from CISA, which is the main federal cybersecurity authority that actually has also safe harbor language in it as well. So all of this is very exciting. And for me personally, because I did spend a lot of time on these issues between law and technology and specifically this landscape uh, for the last years in my prior work at Berkeley before I joined Intel promoting this framework for collaboration. It really is nice to see uh, the growing adoption of Safe Harbor. But one of my key takeaways from this kind of evolving interaction between law and technology is that laws are often basically evolving slower than 
technology. So we know that laws are slowly being amended. It's not like innovation that is rapidly being developed. And laws often have concepts like authorization or reasonable security or principles that are adapted with time. The reason I bring this example is that if you even consider the CFAA, again, this main anti-hacking law that I mentioned, and I'm sure many speakers uh, uh, are speaking about this uh, law throughout DEF CON, it is a law from 1986, before the internet as we knew it today. And many, much has changed, including hacking and security testing. And this year, uh, the Supreme Court is gonna actually take uh, one of the first court cases on this issue of authorization. Uh, and we will see how that will evolve, but it just shows kind of how the laws are adapting to technology, but are often behind. And I think this is one of the main takeaways that for you for in the audience today from our talk, is we're gonna look at this landscape from both a policy and both from a technical perspective, and we're gonna see how, uh, how, uh, how the things are fitting together. So I shared a little bit about my background. Uh, I, to, towards, this, uh, towards this week at DEF CON, a lot has been uh, talked about in terms of Disclose.io and Bug Bounty. You can check out you know, my prior work in this area, but I'm very passionate about this issue of collaboration between researchers and, and hackers and um, companies. And while I am a lawyer and my background is legal, I'm not your lawyer. And today I'm going to be talking about my own personal opinion and I'm not going to be providing any legal advice. So I know this is a little bit of fine print. Uh, you would probably expect that from me, right? Uh, but it is exciting. And, you know, if I need to complement kind of the prior discussion, I, I am also very excited to share that lead Intel. Uh, which I've recently joined, uh, we do have a safe harbor in a bug bounty program, uh, and we encourage you to not just engage with us, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but also know that we have that language in our bug bounty. And with that, I spoke a lot about collaboration. I spoke about why this is important as we think about technology and laws and how they go together. So I want to invite my fearless collaborator, Anait, to tell us a little bit what it is in the evolving attack landscape, uh, and particularly the IoT ecosystem that is sparking all this conversation around IoT proposed regulations and policies. Anait, please take it away. Thanks, Amit. Indeed, it's a great collaboration. So, hi, folks. Uh, very glad to be here. And as Amit said, I work directly on product definition side. So today we are talking about security and regulation policies, right? And being on the receiving side of the regulatory guidelines inside Intel, I spent time understanding and assessing the technical uh, implication. So first, I would like to start looking at the concern that triggers this rising regulatory effort. And one of the key IoT security issue is uh, the expanded attack surface. And that's due to the increased number of the endpoint devices. So uh, we all see these future scapes that predict billions of devices with trillions of sensors. This large number of IoT devices that being bought into the business triggers the growth of attack. Another issue is the sophistication and evolving of the intent. It is clear that the attack target is not limited to the assets of IoT device only. IoT device exposure opens a plethora of opportunity across the edge to cloud and exposes a lot of valuable assets. So let's analyze the genealogy of the IoT attacks. So what you see here is typical IoT solution that spans edge to cloud. So IoT device control other devices in the system and itself they being controlled by others in the edge to cloud solution. This duality exposes enormous challenges for the security community and adds new dimension to the system cybersecurity controls. Attacks that originate on the very left side at the edge easily can propagate throughout the entire pipeline and single device can jeopardize the entire solution. Uh, one notorious example of this type of scenario is a casino fish tank attack. I don't know how many of you are aware of that story, um, but uh, just a quick recap. 
So using a trivial vulnerability in a smart thermometer in the fish tank, hackers gained access to Casino Network. They retrieved data about high-paying customers and then extracted that data through the thermostat and to the cloud. And a result of it, 10 gigabytes of data ended up in Finland. This looks like a Hollywood-ready story, perfect for Ocean Trilogy sequel. But from our perspective, this just proves the point that the simple device, in this case it was the thermometer, can break down the very tough protected end-to-end uh, -end solution. With the, that many new devices already deployed and even more on the way, it is important to consider the unique challenges in IoT space. And first, let's look at the technical side of it. So IoT business world is different from traditional, well-established and structured uh, PC environment, cloud environment. There are several factors that contribute to the technical and business challenges in our world. There are, it's a diversity of distinct market segment and the business model. So very range of the very wide range of the use cases that we are dealing with. IoT usages uh, need to meet stringent uh, power performance and form factor requirements. Another uh, challenge is the complex ecosystem. There are many entities involved in defining finished and customer usable product. Another distinction is the wide range of the software and firmware, which includes OS, hypervisors, bootloaders, right? Of course, application and all the workloads that run on top of it. Heterogeneity of the install base is in that end-to-end -end solution is also a pretty unique factor. IoT is a mix of the green and brown field uh, uh, devices. And on top of it comes the icing. Uh, IoT needs to be supported over extended lifetime, which is much longer than traditional PC uh, servers. All these challenges become contributing factors to vulnerability of IoT devices and introducing security risk. Those are the concerns that actually triggered and got reflected in the policy arena. And here I would like to ask Amit, Please share your insights from the regulatory guideline perspective. Thank you so much, Anait. And you are exactly right. Uh, when it comes to the evolving policy and regulatory sphere, the complexities that we are seeing in terms of the various business model and the technical verticals also influence what are some of the principles that the policymakers are considering as they are coming to propose best practices, reports, uh, standard development and laws uh, and regulations uh, and requirements in this area. So one of the interesting things is this idea of having the risk-based approach. Uh, this is, by the way, an underlying principle for all security policy, but particularly in IoT, it's important. Why? Because we have that horizontal but yet very versatile environment of devices, right? Everything from the low-cost business model of the dog caller, if you will, to the sensitive devices being deployed in critical infrastructure, election system, medical devices, and the like. So with that diversity of technical systems, business models, economic uh, consideration, considering the risk of the device, not just in terms of which vertical and sector it goes into, but what is the environment? What is the unique attack surface the device is being deployed in from various uh, kind of standpoints? That's one of the ideas when you think about the proposed regulations that, that the requirements should apply based on a risk-based approach. And you as researchers should expect a lot more standards and thinking this is already an established principle in the security community and also in IoT, for example, 62443 IEC, but you should, ex should expect more and more thinking and principles and standards around in this area. What more? Definitely the, regu the regulatory um, environment should consider how to support innovations. A lot of this, these problems are going to be solved by technology, and we need to incentivize uh, the development of innovation and consider the fact that proposed regulations might hinder innovation if they're not framed correctly. Interoperability. 
So this is a key issue. We need to think about how the IoT devices are working together. How can we foster the secure deployment that is interoperable for IoT devices? And also how IoT devices are connecting edge to cloud with OT environments, with other environments. All of that is putting interoperability in the kind of front. And here, this idea of leveraging international standards that are scalable, that are developed globally at forums like CTA, ISO, IEC, JTC1, uh, Etsy, and the like, that is also very critical because, as you know, technology knows no boundaries. The, the deployment of IoT is a global, obviously a global phenomenon, but the supply chain of technology is global in its nature. So we want to avoid fragmented regulation or some kind of requirements that are really localized because that's not scalable when you think about manufacturers that are uh, and the supply chain that are globally that are global in their nature. Another key principle that is not unique just by the way for IoT, but is really important for IoT is this idea of design neutrality. That laws and regulations, because they usually adapt, they usually are amended uh, very slowly. They always walk uh, slower than technology. Should not bake into the legislative language. Uh, a specific design or a specific requirement that might become outdated or even terms, for example, like passwords that might change with time or unique technical definition. Instead, we should leverage these international standards and principle-based approaches. Uh, and with all of that, I think a lot of regulators around the world and policymakers are recognizing the need to consider IoT in, in, as part of the broader ecosystem and enable private-public partnerships. So I spoke a lot about the principles, but let's dive in. Let's look at a few examples of what is really kind of cutting edge in terms of proposed regulation in IoT around the world. Now, this is just as an example. I'm going to walk you through a more uh, domains, but this is super interesting. It's coming from the UK. Uh, some of you may have heard about this in the past. I believe it's since 2018, the UK with their leadership have put together an IoT code of security code of practice with 13 requirements. They've taken that effort a step farther, and now they're considering a law, a regulation. This is, I believe, I uh, the third consultation already they are publishing uh, for this regulation. And by, by the way, now it's also, they're also considering to encompass PCs and laptops as part of their regulation. They're really looking at three core requirements that are proposed. Uh, the first one is around this issue of um, uh, not having default password and having unique authentication. This concept is one that we have seen in other regulations around the world. And if you look at the prior consultations, they say explicitly how they, they were motivated by the Mirai attack. So you see the connection between the attack surface, the attack, and then the regulators are considering action. The second requirement is around uh, an issue which is very close to heart to this community, having the public point of contact as part of uh, vulnerability disclosure policy or program to allow researchers like you uh, to uh, submit vulnerabilities to the manufacturer uh, and uh, have the manufacturer address the vulnerabilities. The third point which is proposed is around this issue of support of security updates. By the way, they're also referencing a standard, a technical standard that has been developing uh, as part of a broader consensus at Etsy in Europe, uh, which really talks about consumer IoT uh, requirements in more detail. Uh, but it just kind of shows to you the connection between the standards and the proposed regulation. So if we look at the broader landscape, we do have a lot of things happening uh, in this sphere. Everything from state laws, uh, actually from in Oregon, Oregon and California, we have laws already in effect from January 2020 on connected devices, looking at this issue of reasonable security for connected devices, and they have some language there as well on the issue of uh, authentication means and unique authentication. We also have proposed federal laws. So this is very interesting. Uh, in the United States, there has been a number of proposed 
federal laws for all the United States uh, on this issue of IoT security. One of them is the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act that has been proposed for a while, le looking at leveraging federal procurement of IoT devices with requirements for all devices going into federal procurement as a way to foster security of devices in all domains. We have also seen a recent uh, COVID white paper from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission uh, proposing that we should have all the market IoT federal US law, so certainly an emerging area. We also have best practices and standards. Okay, so this particular area is of particular interest and we're gonna dive, di dive in into the requirements uh, or at least the consensus around what are some kind of the foundational capabilities of IoT devices. This is an effort to bring all of industry together, both at the international level, so that's at ISO, I'm, a, I'm an editor of one of the standards there, but both in the US with efforts like NISTOR 8259, that by the way, is also referenced on the left in the COVID white paper of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So you see the interaction between the efforts. Uh, what's of particular interest for this community is that these are really technical doc documents. They are horizontal. They reflect the consensus of all of industry, uh, and they might shape the future of both research and market demand in this area. We have also seen, ba based on kind of these efforts of overall horizontal uh, kind of uh, trends, sector-specific requirements. So, for for example, uh, NIST has created and worked together on building consensus around. NISTOR 8259, which is always entered to all the market. Now they've also released a draft on GitHub, a federal profile of these requirements that is in particular for the federal government uh, sector. So what goes under FISMA to federal agencies for that particular sector. In addition, of course, this is not just in the US. Uh, I've showed the example from the UK. We have seen around the world uh, attention to these issues with governments like Australia and the UK proposing code of practices for IoT. Australia, in their recent announcement of what they're going to do in terms of cybersecurity policy, they have a segment on IoT there. Of course, in Europe, a big conversation around attestation, certification, and uh, Inisa is definitely also thinking about IoT. Uh, so this is a global phenomenon. And uh, we have seen leadership also from countries like Japan uh, proposing uh, risk-based frameworks for IoT. So definitely of interest for regulators and policymakers around the world. So finally, I talked about international standards and their importance, how they've been uh, developed in this area. We have seen two interesting uh, also I would say trends that go together with IoT. One of them is supply chain transparency. This is, of course, a big theme in the area of security policy, but in particular, uh, it's connected with IoT. So those of you who are long term, term, uh, long term DEF CON attendees or besides Las Vegas attendees or just otherwise might have seen talks from Alan Friedman on the initiative called the S. Bomb, the software bill of materials. Uh, so this is this idea that you should have transparency into the ingredients of the software and that transparency into the ingredients can support the other capabilities like updates and the like. Uh, in this area, we also um, at Intel have some solutions around compute lifecycle assurance. Another trend that we have seen is the coordinate vulnerability disclosure trend that goes together with IoT. So by that, I mean regulators and policymakers are also recognizing the need to leverage the ecosystem, the need to have that collaboration to address the issues, and they're coupling together with proposed reports and regulations and best practices, this idea of having a process to receive vulnerabilities from the external community, and you have seen the example uh, from the UK, and to handle the vulnerabilities internally. So uh, bottom line, a lot of evolving <laughs> the kind of proposed, uh, a lot of evolving kind of initiatives with relationships between them, some are horizontal, some are sector uh, specific, and a bleed towards other areas of security policy. Now we're going to drill down into this NISTER, uh, which is this consensus-driven best practice. This is not a 
regulation or, or, or requirement per se, but it's a consensus effort that is of uh, interest for this community. You can see here on the left, the C2 effort by the Council to Secure the Digital Economy and all the different trade associations really spanning the entire technology sector that have come together to define this consensus. Anait, I would like to invite you to present to us with more detail the technical elements that are explored in the NISTER. Thanks, Amit. So, yeah, um, you heard a lot about NISTA at the magic 8259 number, right? Let's take a closer look what it is. What is the motivation and objective? As this effort very well exemplifies what's happening in the regulatory momentum. So, what is this about? 8259 targets manufacturers. Specifically, the subject of this uh, recommendation is framed around the finished IoT devices. It provides the recommendation on uh, cybersecurity activities and capabilities to address customers' cybersecurity needs. So NIST publication proposes to normalize the manufacturer-customer relationship by leveraging the laws, regulations, and guidelines. Let me set the expectations right. So 8259 is intended to address a very broad range of IoT devices from tiny little doorknobs to very complex critical infrastructure class of devices. So expect to see what I would call it lowest common denominator. However, this is setting the trend, right? It's also important to note that all other parts of the IoT ecosystem, other than IoT device itself, are outside of scope of this NIST recommendation. So overall, this is the first step towards the making the IoT security more measurable. It is expected that eventually more guidelines will be developed to address that out-of-scope problems as well as more specific market segment profiles and the risk-based recommendation will evolve from this one. And we do see it happening already in the federal space, as Amit mentioned earlier. So NIST emphasizes the message, uh, the, uh, the message that IoT security shall start early on. So let's look at their recommended actions. Again, remember, this is all about manufacturers. It is proposed that IoT device manufacturers need to perform this action and provide the services to their customers who would plan that cybersecurity for the devices within their system and in, uh, environment. So NISTER 8259 identifies six specific recommendatory uh, action, pre-market and post-market. The first two activities assume that manufacturers have to have the full disclosure on device usages and the security goals. This might be quite challenging, actually, as there are many cases that we know when customers and manufacturers uh, don't have that good collaboration. As a result, manufacturers cannot expect what will happen with the device in the field. Activity number three is the anchor point for the core baseline capability. These capabilities are defined by NISTA 8259A and supposed to address what customers would need to achieve their goal that fulfill their requirement. This is the most technically loaded proposal in this um, recommendations. Activity number four addresses the support. So manufacturers should consider all the resources required to support development and continued support of the IoT device. That includes security, uh, secure code practices, vulnerability disclosures, um, vulnerability responses, and flow remediation. Post-market, there are activities five and six, and those are related to customer communication. Although I wouldn't call that really post-market, as planning on how to address these activities needs to be baked in at very early stage of the design of the product. There are several potential considerations listed in the publication for this stage. Some of them are the lifespan expectation, the software update, device retirement, and end of life. The main takeaway here, so NIST attempts to frame the security actions around the different stages of the 
device lifecycle, bringing manufacturers to customers. Specifically, it calls out that uh, pre-market development stage core capabilities needs to be addressed. So now let's see what are uh, those core capabilities and drill down here. This baseline represents the industry-wide collaboration effort that Amit mentioned earlier, um, as a result of which definition of uh, common capabilities were produced. And the common is the keyword here. This is not an exhaustive list. Remember the lowest <laughs> denominator? This is starting point that set the direction. Therefore, each implementa implementing organization, in each implementing organization, you may find the superset capabilities that better fit their needs. There are six basic capabilities outlined. The first one is device identification, covers both logical and physical identification. Second is device configuration that can be performed by authorized entities only. Data protection addresses the protection of data from authorized access and modification. Logical access to interfaces is about uh, restricting of logical access to local and network interfaces. Software updates uh, recommends that, again, the updates needs to be done in supervised manner, uh, updated only by authorized entities. And last one here is the cybersecurity state awareness. So this capability is about the ability of IoT device to report its own cybersecurity state and make that information accessible to authorized entities. So this was just a quick run through of the, these capabilities. There are many nuances to this baseline. So I would recommend reading through NISTER's 8259A document directly. And at this point, uh, let's change the gear and look on what's left outside of, out of the NIST scope. So we did talk about the complexity of the ecosystem. So NIST simplified the ecosystem model just to two entities and we at Intel realized that truly deployable IoT solutions require more complex relationship. When we think about Intel, we think about silicon, uh, which would be very left of this picture. It is our partner ecosystem that builds out the rest of the story. So the analogy that we like to use a lot is the orchestra playing together. So each player has a critical role in delivering Finnish symphony to the audience. And uh, the value chain in case of IoT device goes from the ingredient to manufacturers, OEM, ODM, then through the ISVs, uh, cloud service providers, solution integrators, and then only get delivered to the end user. So all these artists right, participate in the security baseline definition and implementation. But there is also the life after the deployment, right? Uh, the device goes to the uh, circular stages of the updates. And again, manufacturers, they have to rely on the rest of the ecosystem to deliver the updates. So what do we do? So we realized that uh, it's not an Intel universe, so we have to work with the broad ecosystem. And we established the partnership. So IoT Solution Alliance is our partnership framework. It covers 6,000 solutions, includes more than 500 members, and of course we work across the globe throughout our global platform. As Amit mentioned, this is very important uh, from the regulatory perspective, the global interaction in the policy space. So our member companies, they span the globe and offer local expertise in market worldwide. This is the community that we're closely collaborating on security as well. And for the security discussion, it's important to establish the common ground. Attack surfaces and threats is that the common ground that we use to build the collaboration. So let's take a look to this, uh, to this table. 
The attack surface sums up all the penetration points, otherwise known as the attack vector. So a summary of exploitable vulnerabilities at device level. So we are looking now at the device level is presented in this table, where different threads on the right side are correlated with respective attack surfaces and components on the left side. Moving from uh, bottom up, you see the hardware layer, right? And then above it is the firmware optional hypervisor with virtual machine monitor, and then the operating system. And finally, this user space where uh, the application or workloads will be running. The attacks in the top layers have been prevalent and known for quite some time already, but uh, attacks are more and more moving down the stacks, exploiting vulnerabilities all the way to the firmware and the hardware layer layers as well, uh, which could potentially give uh, even more interesting um, opportunities, higher privileges on the devices, as well as uh, those attacks can fa go fairly undetected. So let's take an example. So by tampering at the firmware, uh, it, is, it might be possible to subvert the entire boot, right? And boot the operating system, uh, which would be attacker's choice, right? The desired operating system. Uh, this table overall is an eye chart, but I think the main takeaway here is that the attacks are not singular, right? It's a multidimensional problem and spans across the entire stack of IoT device uh, and requires the protection mechanism at each layer as well. So having this framework allows us to systematically analyze the security solution to mitigate the risk from the very early stage of our product design phase. And we work with our customer based on this taxonomy. And we do provide, of course, uh, solutions and innovate the hardware basic security technology in our product to build the defense in depth from the bottom up and uh, withstand the attack propagation. Uh, but I mean, it's uh, not only about our own innovation and our own technologies, right? So, can you share? your thoughts about how these evolving attack surfaces right, uh, can uh, drive a greater collaboration um, with technologists. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, Anna, you're exactly right. I think you've seen throughout this presentation so much of the complexity that is pretty unique uh, for the IoT ecosystem. And this is the vertical business model, the versatile devices from everything from the dog collar to the sensitive systems, the type of the attacks and how the attack surface is evolving, and also the technical uh, challenges, right? And, and Anait um, definitely provided a very extensive overview of this. All of this suggests that this issue is not just going to be solved through the innovations, through the security capabilities that we, we are going to bake into hardware and software and firmware. Yes, that is a critical piece of the discussion. Yes, uh, incentivizing the innovation, the R&D, the research, uh, the, um, the pipeline, all of that is critical, but we are still going to need the collaboration. And by, collab by collaboration, I mean companies working with researchers, enabling the ecosystem, right? Collaboration between the different verticals in the supply chain. Also collaborations between policymakers and legislators and regulators as they're thinking about these issues between the public and the private industry and having your expertise, the expertise of the crowd in, the, in these arenas as well, engaging in that dialogue. And I think we have seen tremendous um, developments in that area. I think the safe harbor uh, kind of discussion is one of them. We have seen also growing collaboration and a lot of thinking that goes into researcher relations. I don't know if you've seen some of my peers from PCERT and uh, from Intel Security at the Red Team Village or in this village talking about how we collaborate with the ecosystem, how we are funding academic researchers in this area. All that is critical. So as we are thinking about this conversation, it's really critical critical to get the dialogue going. And 
in that particular uh, uh, kind of, with that particular recommendation, I would like to invite you all to ethically hack us. We do have a bug bounty. It's a public bug bounty. We offer uh, rewards. You can check it out. Uh, you can check out the scope. We also have a vulnerability disclosure program. You can report vulnerabilities to us. The collaboration with the researcher uh, community is extremely important to us. And we work with the entire ecosystem uh, to drive security first. Uh, so security, secure at intel.com please report your vulnerabilities please continue the great work and research in the embedded system arena uh, especially this village is dear to heart uh, for us uh, and let's continue the conversation and we would like to welcome your questions I did went through uh, in, in a true Israeli fashion and a little bit of my style uh, my sister always tells me to slow down I went through a lot of examples uh, when I was talking and I will provide you the links to all of these resources that I've talked about and Anna shared as well in the Discord chat. Mm -hmm. So this is just a little bit of preview. Uh, please join us in the Discord if you wanna get all the details and all the information about what we shared with you today, you can find it there as well. And we'd like to con continue the conversation uh, with you. Anna, for me, this has been a great collaboration. Uh, uh, the former hacker that I collaborated with in a talk is my sister, Karen. I hope to continue that collaboration. Maybe she is here with us in the audience. K Karen, I haven't uh, forgotten you, <laughs> of course. Uh, but this has been a really uh, joyful uh, dialogue for me. Thank you so much. Anything to share from your perspective, Anne, before we wrap it up? No, this is a, a great journey and uh, this is a great example of collaboration. Again, I am on the technology side, I'm on the product side, Amit represents a more the regulatory perspective and this is when these two when the two towards it, we, uh, we see absolutely new perspective, right? So collaboration is the key and thank you very much. We are looking to hear from you.